Section 36, Part 1 of The Decline and Fall of the Roman Empire, Volume 3. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Chapter 36. Sack of Rome by Genseric, King of the Vandals, His Naval Depredations, Secession of the Last Emperors of the West, Maximus, Avitus, Majorian, Severus, Anthemius, Olibrius, Glycerius, Nepos, Augustulus. Final Extinction of the Western Empire. Reign of Odoacer, the first barbarian king of Italy. The loss or desolation of the provinces from the ocean to the Alps impaired the glory and greatness of Rome. Her internal prosperity was irretrievably destroyed by the separation of Africa. The rapacious vandals confiscated the patrimonial estates of the senators, and intercepted the regular subsidies which relieved the poverty and encouraged the idleness of the plebeians. The distress of the Romans was soon aggravated by an unexpected attack, and the province, so long cultivated for their use by industrious and obedient subjects, was armed against them by an ambitious barbarian. The Vandals and the Alani, who followed the successful standard of Genseric, had acquired a rich and fertile territory, which stretched along the coast above ninety days' journey from Tangier to Tripoli. But their narrow limits were pressed and confined, on either side, by the sandy desert and the Mediterranean. The discovery and the conquest of the black nations that might dwell beyond the torrid zone could not tempt the rational ambition of Genseric, but he cast his eyes towards the sea and he resolved to create a naval power, and his bold resolution was executed with steady and active perseverance. The woods of Mount Atlas afforded an inexhaustible nursery of timber, and his new subjects were skilled in the arts of navigation and shipbuilding. He animated his daring vandals to embrace a mode of warfare which could render every maritime country accessible to their arms. The Moors and Africans were allured by the hope of plunder, and after an interval of six centuries, the fleets that issued from the port of Carthage again claimed the empire of the Mediterranean. The success of the Vandals, the conquest of Sicily, the sack of Palermo, and their frequent descents on the coast of Lucania, awakened and alarmed the mother of Valentinian and the sister of Theodosius. Alliances were formed, and armaments, expensive and ineffectual, were prepared for the destruction of the common enemy, who reserved his courage to encounter those dangers which his policy could not prevent or elude. The designs of the Roman government were repeatedly baffled by his artful delays, ambiguous promises, and apparent concessions, and the interposition of his formidable confederate, the king of the Huns, recalled the emperors from the conquest of Africa to the care of their domestic safety. The revolutions of the palace, which left the western empire without a defender and without a lawful prince, dispelled the apprehensions and stimulated the avarice of Genseric. He immediately equipped a numerous fleet of Vandals and Moors, and cast anchor at the mouth of the Tiber, about three months after the death of Valentinian and the elevation of Maximus to the imperial throne. The private life of the senator, Petronius Maximus, was often alleged as the rare example of human felicity. His birth was noble and illustrious, since he descended from the Anician family, his dignity was supported by an adequate patrimony in land and money, and these advantages of fortune were accompanied with liberal arts and decent manners, which adorn or imitate the inestimable gifts of genius and virtue. The luxury of his palace and table was hospitable and elegant. Whenever Maximus appeared in public, he was surrounded by a train of grateful and obsequious clients, and it is possible that among these clients he might deserve and possess some real friends. His merit was rewarded by the favor of the prince and senate. He thrice exercised the office of Praetorian Prefect of Italy. He was twice invested with the consulship, and he obtained the rank of patrician. These civil honors were not incompatible with the enjoyment of leisure and tranquility. His hours, according to the demands of pleasure or reason, were accurately distributed by a water-clock, and this avarice of time may be allowed to prove the sense which Maximus entertained of his own happiness. The injury which he received from the Emperor Valentinian appears to excuse the most bloody revenge. Yet, a philosopher might have reflected that, 
if the resistance of his wife had been sincere, her chastity was still inviolate, and that it could never be restored if she had consented to the will of the adulterer. A patriot would have hesitated before he plunged himself and his country into those inevitable calamities which must follow the extinction of the royal house of Theodosius. The imprudent Maximus disregarded these salutary considerations. He gratified his resentment and ambition. He saw the bleeding corpse of Valentinian at his feet. He heard himself saluted emperor by the unanimous voice of the senate and people. But the day of his inauguration was the last day of his happiness. He was imprisoned, such is the lively expression of Sidonius, in the palace. And after passing a sleepless night, he sighed that he had obtained the summit of his wishes and aspired only to descend from the dangerous elevation. Oppressed by the weight of the diadem, he communicated his anxious thoughts to his friend and quaestor, Fulgentius, and when he looked back with unavailing regret on the secure pleasures of his former life, the emperor exclaimed, O fortunate Damocles, thy reign began and ended with the same dinner, a well-known allusion, which Fulgentius afterwards repeated, as an instructive lesson for princes and subjects. The reign of Maximus continued about three months. His hours, of which he had lost the command, were disturbed by remorse or guilt or terror, and his throne was shaken by the seditions of the people, of the soldiers, and the confederate barbarians. The marriage of his son Palladius with the eldest daughter of the late emperor might tend to establish the hereditary secession of his family, but the violence which he offered to the empress Eudocia could proceed only from the blind impulse of lust or revenge. His own wife, the cause of these tragic events, had been seasonably removed by death, and the widow of Valentinian was compelled to violate her decent mourning, perhaps her real grief, and to submit to the embraces of a presumptuous usurper, whom she suspected as the assassin of her deceased husband. These suspicions were soon justified by the indiscreet confession of Maximus himself, and he wantonly provoked the hatred of his reluctant bride, who was still conscious that she descended from a line of emperors. From the east, however, Eudocia could not hope to obtain any effectual assistance. Her father and her aunt, Polcuria, were dead. Her mother languished at Jerusalem in disgrace and exile, and the scepter of Constantinople was in the hands of a stranger. She directed her eyes towards Carthage, secretly implored the aid of the king of the Vandals, and persuaded Genseric to improve the fair opportunity of disguising his rapacious designs by the specious names of honor justice, and compassion. Whatever abilities Maximus might have shown in a subordinate station, he was found incapable of administering an empire, and though he might easily have been informed of the naval preparations which were made on the opposite shores of Africa, he expected with supine indifference the approach of the enemy, without adopting any measures of defense, of negotiation, or of a timely retreat. When the Vandals disembarked at the mouth of the Tiber, the emperor was suddenly roused from his lethargy by the clamors of a trembling and exasperated multitude. The only hope which presented itself to his astonished mind was that of a precipitate flight, and he exhorted the senators to imitate the examples of their prince. But no sooner did Maximus appear in the streets than he was assaulted by a shower of stones. A Roman or a Burgundian soldier claimed the honor of the first wound. His mangled body was ignominiously cast into the Tiber. The Roman people rejoiced in the punishment which they had inflicted on the author of the public calamities, and the domestics of Eudocia signalized their zeal in the service of their mistress. On the third day after the tumult, Genseric boldly advanced from the port of Ostia to the gates of the defenseless city. Instead of a sally of the Roman youth, there issued from the gates an unarmed and venerable procession of the bishop at the head of his clergy. The fearless spirit of Leo, his authority and eloquence again mitigated the fierceness of a barbarian conqueror. The king of the Vandals promised to spare the unresisting multitude, to protect the buildings from fire, and to exempt the captives from torture. And although such orders were neither seriously given nor strictly obeyed, the mediation of Leo was glorious to himself, and in some degree beneficial to his country. But Rome and its inhabitants were delivered to the licentiousness of the Vandals and Moors, whose blind passions revenged the injuries of Carthage. The pillage lasted fourteen days and nights, and all that yet remained of public or private wealth, of sacred or profane treasure, was diligently transported to the vessels of Genseric. Among the spoils, 
the splendid relics of two temples, or rather of two religions, exhibited a memorable example of the vicissitudes of human and divine things. Since the abolition of paganism, the capital had been violated and abandoned, yet the statues of the gods and heroes were still respected, and the curious roof of gilt bronze was reserved for the rapacious hands of Genseric. The holy instruments of the Jewish worship, the gold table and the gold candlestick with seven branches, originally framed according to the particular instructions of God himself, and which were placed in the sanctuary of his temple, had been ostentatiously displayed to the Roman people in the triumph of Titus. They were afterwards deposited in the temple of peace, and at the end of four hundred years the spoils of Jerusalem were transferred from Rome to Carthage by a barbarian who derived his origin from the shores of the Baltic. These ancient monuments might attract the notice of curiosity as well as of avarice, but the Christian churches, enriched and adorned by the prevailing superstition of the times, afforded more plentiful materials for sacrilege, and the pious liberality of Pope Leo, who melted six silver vases, the gift of Constantine, each of a hundred pounds weight, is an evidence of the damage which he attempted to repair. In the forty-five years that had elapsed since the Gothic invasion, the pomp and luxury of Rome were in some measure restored, and it was difficult either to escape or to satisfy the avarice of a conqueror, who possessed leisure to collect, and the ships to transport the wealth of the capital. The imperial ornaments of the palace, the magnificent furniture and wardrobe, the sideboards of massy plate, were accumulated with disorderly rapine. The gold and silver amounted to several thousand talents. Yet even the brass and copper were laboriously removed. Eudocia herself, who advanced to meet her friend and deliverer, soon bewailed the imprudence of her own conduct. She was rudely stripped of her jewels, and the unfortunate empress with her two daughters, the only surviving remains of the great Theodosius, was compelled, as a captive, to follow the haughty vandal, who immediately hoisted sail and returned with a prosperous navigation to the port of Carthage. Many thousand Romans of both sexes, chosen for some useful or agreeable qualifications, reluctantly embarked on board the fleet of Genseric, and their distress was aggravated by the unfeeling barbarians, who, in the division of the booty, separated the wives from their husbands, the children from their parents. The charity of Deogratius, bishop of Carthage, was their only consolation and support. He generously sold the gold and silver plate of the church to purchase the freedom of some, to alleviate the slavery of others, and to insist the wants and infirmities of a captive multitude, whose health was impaired by the hardships which they had suffered in the passage from Italy to Africa. By his order, two spacious churches were converted into hospitals. The sick were distributed in convenient beds and liberally supplied with food and medicines, and the aged prelate repeated his visits, both in the day and night, with an assiduity that surpassed his strength and a tender sympathy which enhanced the value of his services. Compare this scene with the field of Cannae, and judge between Hannibal and the successor of St. Cyprian. The deaths of Aetius and Valentinian had relaxed the ties which held the barbarians of Gaul in peace and subordination. The seacoast was infested by the Saxons, the Alemanni and the Franks advanced from the Rhine to the Seine, and the ambition of the Goths seemed to meditate more extensive and permanent conquests. The Emperor Maximus relieved himself by a judicious choice from the weight of these distant cares. He silenced the solicitations of his friends, listened to the voice of fame, and promoted a stranger to the general command of the forces in Gaul. Avitus, the stranger whose merit was so nobly rewarded, descended from a wealthy and honorable family in the diocese of Auvergne. The convulsions of the times urged him to embrace, with the same ardor, the civil and military professions, and the indefatigable youth blended the studies of literature and jurisprudence with the exercise of arms and hunting. Thirty years of his life were laudably spent in the public service. He alternately displayed his talents in war and negotiation, and the soldier of Aetius, after executing the most important embassies, was raised to the station of Praetorian Prefect of Gaul. Either the merit of Avitus excited envy, or his moderation was desirous of repose, since he calmly retired to an estate which he possessed in the neighborhood of Clermont. A copious stream, issuing from the mountain, and falling headlong into many a loud and foaming cascade, discharged its waters into a lake about two miles in length, and the villa was pleasantly seated on the margin of the lake. 
The baths, the porticos, the summer and winter apartments, were adapted to the purposes of luxury and use, and the adjacent country afforded the various prospects of woods, pastures, and meadows. In this retreat, where Avitus amused his leisure with books, rural sports, and the practice of husbandry and the society of his friends, he received the imperial diploma, which constituted him Master General of the Cavalry and Infantry of Gaul. He assumed the military command. The barbarians suspended their fury, and whatever means he might employ, whatever concessions he might be forced to make, the people enjoyed the benefits of actual tranquility. But the fate of Gaul depended on the Visigoths, and the Roman general, less attentive to his dignity than to the public interest, did not disdain to visit Toulouse in the character of an ambassador. He was received with courteous hospitality by Theodoric, the king of the Goths, but while Avitus laid the foundations of a solid alliance with that powerful nation, he was astonished by the intelligence that the emperor Maximus was slain, and that Rome had been pillaged by the Vandals. A vacant throne, which he might ascend without guilt or danger, tempted his ambition, and the Visigoths were easily persuaded to support his claim by their irresistible suffrage. They loved the person of Avitus, they respected his virtues, and they were not insensible of the advantage, as well as of honor, of giving an emperor to the west. The season was now approaching in which the annual assembly of the seven provinces was held at Arles. Their deliberations might perhaps be influenced by the presence of Theodoric and his martial brothers, but their choice would naturally incline to the most illustrious of their countrymen. Avitus, after a decent resistance, accepted the imperial diadem from the representatives of Gaul, and his election was ratified by the acclamations of the barbarians and provincials. The formal consent of Marcian, emperor of the East, was solicited and obtained, but the Senate, Rome, and Italy, though humbled by their recent calamities, submitted, with a secret murmur, to the presumption of the Gallic usurper. Theodoric, to whom Avitus was indebted to, for the purple, had acquired the Gothic scepter by the murder of his elder brother Torismond, and he has justified this atrocious deed by the design which his predecessor had formed of violating his alliance with the empire. Such a crime might not be incompatible with the virtues of a barbarian, but the manners of Theodoric were gentle and humane, and posterity may contemplate, without terror, the original picture of a Gothic king, whom Sidonius had intimately observed in the hours of peace and of social intercourse. In an epistle, dated from the court of Toulouse, the orator satisfies the curiosity of one of his friends, in the following description. By the majesty of his appearance, Theodoric would command the respect of those who are ignorant of his merit, and although he was born a prince, his merit would dignify a private station. He is of middle stature, his body appears rather plump than fat, and in his well-proportioned limbs agility is united with muscular strength. If you examine his countenance, you will distinguish a high forehead, large shaggy eyebrows, an equiline nose, thin lips, a regular set of white teeth, and a fair complexion that blushes more frequently from modesty than from anger. The ordinary distribution of his time, as far as it is exposed to the public view, may be concisely represented. Before daybreak he repairs, with a small train, to his domestic chapel, where the service is performed by the Arian clergy but those who presume to interpret his secret sentiments consider this assiduous devotion as the effect of habit and policy. The rest of the morning is employed in the administration of his kingdom. His chair is surrounded by some military officers of decent aspect and behavior. The noisy crowd of his barbarian guards occupies the hall of audience, but they are not permitted to stand within the veils or curtains that conceal the council chamber from vulgar eyes. The ambassadors of the nations are successively introduced. Theodoric listens with attention, answers them with discreet brevity, and either announces or delays, according to the nature of their business, his final resolution. About eight, the second hour, he rises from his throne, and visits either his treasury or his stables. If he chooses to hunt, or at least to exercise himself on horseback, his bow is carried by a favorite youth, but when a game is marked, he bends it with his own hand and seldom misses the object of his aim. As a king he disdains to bear arms in such ignoble warfare, but as a soldier he would blush to accept any military service that he could perform himself. On common days his dinner is not different from the repast of a private citizen, but every Saturday many honorable guests are invited to the royal table, which on these occasions is served with the elegance of Greece, the plenty of Gaul, 
and the order and diligence of Italy. The gold or silver plate is less remarkable for its weight than for the brightness and curious workmanship. The taste is gratified without the help of foreign and costly luxury. The size and number of, of the cups of wine are regulated with a strict regard to the laws of temperance, and the respectful silence that prevails is interrupted only by grave and instructive conversation. After dinner, Theodoric sometimes indulges himself in a short slumber, and as soon as he wakes he calls for the dice and tables, encourages his friends to forget the royal majesty, and is delighted when they freely express the passions which are excited by the incidents at play. At this game, which he loves as the image of war, he alternately displays his eagerness, his skill, his patience, and his cheerful temper. If he loses, he laughs. He is modest and silent if he wins. Yet notwithstanding this seeming indifference, his courtiers choose to solicit any favor in the moments of victory, and I myself, in my applications to the king, have derived some benefit from my losses. About the ninth hour, three o'clock, the tide of business again returns and flows incessantly till after sunset, when the signal of the royal supper dismisses the weary crowd of suppliants and pleaders. At the supper, a more familiar repast, buffoons and pantomimes are sometimes introduced, to divert, not to offend, the company by their ridiculous wit. But female singers, and the soft effeminate modes of music, are severely banished, and such martial tunes as animate the soul to deeds of valor, are alone grateful to the ear of Theodoric. He retires from table, and the nocturnal guards are immediately posted at the entrance of the treasury, the palace, and the private apartments. When the king of the Visigoths encouraged Avitus to assume the purple, he offered his person and his forces as a faithful soldier of the Republic. The exploits of Theodoric soon convinced the world that he had not degenerated from the warlike virtues of his ancestors. After the establishment of the Goths in Aquitaine, and the passage of the Vandals into Africa, the Suevi, who had fixed their kingdom in Galicia, aspired to the conquest of Spain, and threatened to extinguish the feeble remains of the Roman dominion. The provincials of Carthagena and Tarragona, afflicted by an hostile invasion, represented their injuries and their apprehensions. Count Fronto was dispatched, in the name of the Emperor Avitus, with advantageous offers of peace and alliance, and Theodoric interposed his weighty mediation to declare that, Unless his brother-in-law, the king of the Suevi, immediately retired, he would be obliged to arm in the cause of justice and of Rome. Tell him, replied the haughty Reciarius, that I despise his friendship and his arms, but that I will soon try whether he will dare to expect my arrival under the walls of Toulouse. Such a challenge urged Theodoric to prevent the bold designs of his enemy. He passed the Pyrenees at the head of the Visigoths. The Franks and Burgundians served under his standards, and though he professed himself the dutiful servant of Avitus, he privately stipulated, for himself and his successors, the absolute possession of his Spanish conquests. The two armies, or rather the two nations, encountered each other on the banks of the river Urbicus, about twelve miles from Astorga, and the decisive victory of the Goths appeared for a while to have extirpated the name and kingdom of the Suevi. From the field of battle Theodoric advanced to Braga, their metropolis, which still retained the splendid vestiges of his ancient commerce and dignity. His entrance was not polluted with blood, and the Goths respected the chastity of their female captives, more especially of the consecrated virgins. But the greatest part of the clergy and people were made slaves, and even the churches and altars were confounded in the universal pillage. The unfortunate king of the Sueve had escaped to one of the ports of the ocean, but the obstinacy of the winds opposed his flight, and he was delivered to his implacable rival. And Ricarius, who neither desired nor expected mercy, received, with manly constancy, the death which he would probably have inflicted. After this bloody sacrifice to policy or resentment, Theodoric carried his victorious arms as far as Marita, the principal town of Lusitania, without meeting any resistance except from the miraculous powers of St. Eualia, but he was stopped in the full career of success, and recalled from Spain before he could provide for the security of his conquests. In his retreat towards the Pyrenees, he revenged his disappointment on the country through which he passed, and, in the sack of Palentia and Astorga, he showed himself a faithless ally, as well as a cruel enemy. Whilst the king of the Visigoths fought and vanquished in the name of Avitus, the reign of Avitus had expired, 
and both the honour and interest of Theodoric were deeply wounded by the disgrace of a friend whom he had seated on the throne of the Western Empire. End of chapter 36, part 1